we are going to keep this interactive, but we're going to use the chat to interact. And um, I'm going to share my screen. Give me a second. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. And very happy to be here today with all of you. So today we're gonna to be talking about building culturally responsive practices. And I'm gonna start the slideshow. Excellent, all right. So let's, we're gonna get right into it because the time is going to fly by, um, but we will pause periodically for, um, for you to do some reflecting and sharing as we go throughout the afternoon. So anytime I do this equity work, I always like to start with some norms just because it's, um, it's not always the um, easiest conversations to have. So, you know, we, I'd like to remind you that, you know, students are at the center of this work. Um, you know, understanding that this conversation can sometimes be uncomfortable or painful for some. And so we commit to being sensitive and supportive and respectful. Um, there's an opportunity for all of us to learn um, and blame will only impede growth and advancement of this equity work so we try to avoid um, blaming others. And then for equity to become a reality, business as usual will not suffice. So as we go through this afternoon session, we are looking, um, hoping that as you walk away, you'll gain a better under understanding of what's meant by culturally responsive practices um, in order to make changes in your districts um, that either address disproportionality or anything beyond disproportionality. Um, you will learn strategies for building stronger relationships and there'll be opportunities for you to reflect throughout um, throughout this whole session. So hopefully you will enjoy that. Now let me move the camera over here. That way you guys aren't, um, all right. So let's keep it moving. All right. I love this quote from the National Equity Project and I use this often, um, that the role for leaders for equity is to make inequities visible, to disrupt policies and practices that perpetuate inequities and create and design ways of engaging in communities and educating our young people so that everyone experiences a sense of belonging and thrive. So whenever I think about this equity work, I'm thinking about um, all of you and the roles that you play in your um, in your lives, you know, whether you are leading uh, districts or um, sitting on school boards or other organizations or in the classroom, all of these I think are critical to, um, uh, to helping move the needle for students and address the issues that um, create inequities within your districts. So, um, hopefully this is something that you think about and inspire and you're inspired by because ultimately for inequities to go away we really have to be willing to um, to talk about them we have to be willing willing to dismantle them and to disrupt them so this is the first question that i want to pose to you and you can use the chat to respond and that question is how were you wounded by school so um if you don't mind just sharing. And while you're writing, I will share an experience that I had uh, in second grade. In second grade, uh, that was the first time that I experienced racism. I didn't grow up in New Jersey. I grew up in another uh, state. And um, I um, was the only, eventually, the only black child in, in this particular classroom. And unfortunately, um, the teacher treated me far differently than she treated the other students. Um, she isolated me, she ignored me, she often didn't um, call on me when I would raise my hand, and she was mean to me. Um, at seven years old, I had no idea what um, racism was, but the only thing I could imagine was I was different from my peers, and that the reason why she was treating me differently was because of that. Um, Again, not having the language to understand that, but I knew that she didn't treat me fairly and she didn't treat me well and she didn't treat me the way she was treating the other students in the classroom. And, you know, um, that memory stayed with me for many, many years. But I, it was so important to me to have that experience because it, while it wounded me in that, in that time frame, it also propelled me. 
So in the work that I've done since then, I've had a commitment to ensuring that all students are able to thrive and feel like they belong in their classrooms and that they are not isolated, they're not ignored, they're not made to be othered in any way. Um, and just as an aside, when I became an adult, I had an opportunity to look at uh, a box of, my parents handed me a box of, you know, memories from my childhood, you know, a few years ago. And in that box was my report card from that second grade teacher. And her comments were all negative comments. And so that memory was like solidified and memorialized in writing. And I hadn't, I had not seen that report card. Maybe I, pro I don't recall ever seeing the report card, maybe when I was a child, but I didn't have a memory of that report card. So to see that report card all these years later it solidified the memories that I had. I was like, I knew that lady didn't like me, um, but I'm thankful that I, I didn't let it stop me. Um, but that's not always the case for some children. So as I'm looking at in the chat, um, and here's where I will uh, ask my assistant to, to help, my proctor. Um, Leslie, what are some of the themes that you're seeing coming out in the chat? So I'm seeing that teachers uh, and counselors just not saying very helpful things to their students, like um, only be admitted to university because of their race, or they should um, go to school to become a secretary as opposed to a doctor, or you're smarter than you look. Um, really hurtful comments, actually, as I'm reading them. Uh, never amount to anything and try to dissuade them from going to college. Wow. Uh, yeah, really hurtful. Um, someone should just get married instead of going on to college. Wow. Um, pretty hurtful things. Very um, hurtful. The last one, another one, high school principal that she was surprised she was smart and had parents that were still together. Oh, I don't even like saying that out loud. Um, and another one, make a good secretary. Wow. Yeah. And you know, the, I, I often will open with this question. Uh, I actually stole it from, um, from a colleague of mine in, in the, in the field um, who asked that question of, of a number of leaders. And I've asked this question multiple times in different settings. And um, I'll ask this question because it really, first of all, it brings to light some of the challenges that we've had as children in classrooms, but it also um, gives us a little bit more empathy when we think about the students that come into our classrooms today. And unfortunately, our stories are very similar to the stories that many students experience in the classroom today. And what's often missing or lacking is a teacher or an educator or a leader who is culturally responsive to the needs of those students. So let's, let's move on. Thank you so much for those of you who shared your stories. I, I really appreciate your vulnerability um, and just, you know, um, just sharing this experience. So when we think about the state of New Jersey, we're a very diverse state. That's not new to you. Over half of our students are students of color. Um, and, and yet we have, you know, less than 20% of our teachers who are teachers of color, which creates a racial cultural mismatch between students and teachers. Now, that could or could not be a bad thing. We can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we also know that there have been some persistent gaps in achievement, in opportunity, in access, in teacher quality, in um, food and housing and security and quality health care and safe neighborhoods and so much more. And these are the experiences that our students are having in schools across this entire state. And whenever we talk about culturally responsive practices, we, we have to put, you know, that we have to, to uh, make sure that we are also talking about the elephant in the room, which is, you know, race. And, and race oftentimes is, is uncomfortable for people to have conversations about. Um, you know, when I think about race, it's really a socially constructed, high, uh, um, it's a socially constructed um, term, but it has been used in our country to create hierarchy based upon skin pigmentation and ancestry. Um, I uh, took this quote from Dr. Tyrone Howard, who was actually our um, keynote speaker in the 2019 Equity for All conference that the department hosted. And um, this is from a, a book with a number of different um, uh, scholars who've contributed to it. But this particular quote, race matters because many people still attach hierarchical social 
value to people's skin color and physical features. To be clear, it's not actually the skin color that matters. It's the baggage about skin color that we as humans carry that make race so difficult to address. And so I put that out there because I really think it, it, it just kind of um, gives us a really good perspective on this, this construct of race. Um, and I really believe that educators can work with any group of student, students uh, if they are culturally responsive, which addresses that racial cultural mismatch that can exist in a number of the classrooms um, in schools across the state and across the country. So that's not unique to New Jersey. Um, it's really important that educators acknowledge their students' race. While it's a construct, it still exists. And, you know, avoiding um, being colorblind is really critical. So I still uh, run into educators, even as recently as this year and last year, who, you know, will say, well, you know, all, all students are the same. I see all students the same. They, you know, they're just kids to me. Um, and while they are well-meaning, ultimately what they are saying, they're sending a message to that student. And what I say to people oftentimes is if you say to me, you, you don't see my color, you don't recognize my color, what you're saying is you don't see me. I know I'm a black woman. I know when I walk into a room, that immutable, immutable characteristic is going to be evident to anyone that sees me. You'll see that first. And so, you know, for you to pretend like you don't see it um, is, is unfair. Um, and so it's really important that we um, help our students to recognize that we acknowledge their race, we acknowledge their skin color, we acknowledge their culture, um, and that it's really important to helping them because that's, that's part of their identity. And we, we have various identities that intersect. Um, and, you know, some of those identifiers or ways that we identify ourselves are by our gender or, or language or family position or sexual orientation or culture, and the list goes on. Um, sometimes out in these sessions, I'll ask you to just, how do you identify yourself? And I'll find, you know, that you'll just give me a list of, you know, 10, sometimes 15 different ways that you might identify yourself. And, you know, race is one way that we often identify ourselves. And so for us as educators to pretend like we don't notice that with students um, does that, does a disservice to the students who come in front of us. Let's talk about culture. In the chat, if you don't mind, just quickly, just jotting down how you define culture. Now I'll pause for a moment to give you a chance to, to respond. It's also interesting. Um, I was uh, thinking about um, how you might, how I'm, I've been in public places and heard, you know, small children whispering to their um, parents about, you know, someone's race or ethnicity, and the parent kind of shushes them. And it's like, actually, you really don't have to do that. There's no shame in who we are and how we identify ourselves. Um, so I see some of the the comments in the chat. I'm, I'm able to kind of like run quickly through them, customs and traditions and beliefs, norms and values, um, your worldview, attitudes. I would agree with all of these. Um, and then just to kind of um, synopsize some of what you're saying, um, Richard Mil Milner, the author of uh, Racing to Class, defines culture as, as the deep-rooted values, beliefs, languages, customs, and norms of a group of people. So you're right on track with, with your responses. Um, and you know, it's, it's, I wanna just share with you how um, culture was viewed at one point. Um, scholars posit that awareness of culture was previously intended to help student groups who were not a part of the dominant culture. And the idea was if, you know, to help those students to assimilate into the system of the dominant culture, um, because that was considered normal, that was considered what was, was valued. Um, and we know now that that approach 
um, actually does harm to students. And so, but, but that's, you know, historically something that had occurred. And, and that was something that was believed to be the way that we address culture in schools. Um, and so, you know, I want you just, you know, I'm sure most of you are here because that probably is not the way that you think. Um, hopefully it's not the way that you think. And, and the idea here is to build upon that thinking. Um, and, and here's a question that you, you don't have to respond to, but you can think about, you know, how is your school and or classroom inclusive of students' identities, backgrounds, languages, and realities? You can respond to that, but I'm going to keep moving just in light of, in light of the time. So I wanted to just kind of share some background with you on what various scholars, how they define culturally responsive and culturally relevant practices. Um, Gloria Latson Billings and Geneva Gay are two um, scholars who have done a lot of work in this area. Uh, Gloria has also done a lot of work with um, critical race theory, um, which is not our topic for today. But you can see here on the screen how both of them define culturally relevant practices. Um, and, you know, Gloria focuses to, on the pedagogy that, you know, empowers students intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically by use, using their cultural reference to impart knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And Geneva talks about it as, um, you know, the cultural knowledge, the prior experiences, the frames of reference and performance styles of ethnically diverse students to make learning encounters more relevant and effective for, for them. Um, another scholar goes on to um, describe culturally responsive practices and, and sees it as examining the instructional philosophy and, and practice critically, both acknowledging and searching for the presence of historical forms of oppression embodied in the curriculum instruction and approaches to teacher-student relationships, as well as a critical lens that's been applied to curriculum, classroom design, oops, sorry, um, instruction, homeschool relationships, um, disciplinary policies, school-wide initiatives to promote equity, social justice, community outreach, reach, improvements to school climate and academic achievement. That's a mouthful. That's a lot. But, you know, we look at what the, the original screen with um, Gloria and Geneva Gay's um, perspectives and um, definitions, if you will, of culturally respect, uh, responsive practices or relevant practices. And then we, we build upon that. And here I want to just pause and give you a moment to respond. And I have two questions that I want you to look at, and you can respond to one or the other. In what ways um, can you challenge students intellectually and or what's a first step that you might uh, want to make to begin the journey towards being more culturally relevant? So if, in, if you don't mind in, your, um, in the chats responding to either of these two questions, um, we can use that as kind of a jumping off point in, in dialogue and build upon that. So either what ways can you challenge students intellectually and what first step might you want to make to begin the journey towards becoming more culturally relevant? The high levels of rigor, absolutely. Learn to know who you are in this work. Yep, that identity piece is really important. Continue to educate. Meeting each family that you serve. And learning about students' cultures, yes. You know, the interesting thing about learning about students' cultures, you, it, you know, it, you may do a great job learning about, depending on where you are, every student's culture in your classroom. Um, yet that's not necessarily what, what culturally responsive practices is asking for you to do per se in terms of, you know, studying every single one. But the idea here is getting to know the students that are in front of you. Um, and even as we learn about their culture, recognizing that culture is not a monolith. So there aren't any students who is going to represent everything about their culture. And if you have two students from the same culture sitting next to each other, they may have different values, different experiences, um, different um, 
uh, perspectives that they bring to their culture and yet they aren't the same. Um, and so one of the reasons why I say, you know, the, the focus isn't so much on every single culture as it is on each of the students that are sitting before you because they may be from the same ethnic or racial background and yet have very vastly different cultural experiences um, simply because no one is the same. Um, Leslie, what else are you seeing in the, in the chat? Uh, I'm seeing that a resources, uh, learning about diversity within the home can relate to maybe someone in the class. Mm -hmm. um, reading associated work, uh, reading other work associated with this. Um, don't be afraid of what we need to do for all of our students, really putting it out there. Um, finding themselves in every content area, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, an important piece. The last one says, I'm working on my use of coded language and what I mean when I say certain things, if those meanings harm some uh, groups, perpetuating stereotypes or aimed at a certain group as the norm. That's great work. Yeah. That's great work. Um, Zaretta Hammond is also um, a, a well-known scholar um, who has written a book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. If you haven't had a chance to pick it up, it's one that would inform your work in classrooms. She really puts a great emphasis on the responsive piece of being culturally responsive and um, improving the learning capacity of all the students that are, that are sitting in, in your classroom and beginning to see students as learners and as scholars. And, you know, she centers around this the cognitive aspects of teaching and learning. And it, it's, it's really important to, um, to read her work because I think it'll give you a perspective that um, will expand your thinking around how you respond to students. Um, you know, she sees culturally responsive teaching or practices um, as an opportunity to um, build resilience with students and their academic mindset by also pushing back on some of the dominant narratives about people of color, and I'm gonna give you a chance to respond to that in a moment, um, really trying to create an environment that is intellectual, where all students see themselves as learners, um, an environment where competence precedes confidence. Um, I, I'm reminded of, you know, years ago when I was in the classroom, uh, I was, you know, I had a student who was later, um, classified after leaving my classroom he was later classified as having a learning disability but i recognized that he struggled while he was in my classroom and i i had very high expectations for all of my students and at no time did i lower those expectations just because uh, a student struggled that just meant i had an opportunity to provide more resources to provide more support to that student but i'll never forget and and just, I, sometimes I like to share stories, but I'll never forget uh, the, his parent coming in one day and complaining that my expectations were too high for her son. And I, you know, I pushed back against that um, because I didn't believe at any point that he could not do the work. Yes, he needed more support. Yes, he may have needed additional resources, but I believe that he was capable of doing that work and I never lowered my expectations of him. I never um, uh, created an environment where he was not intellectually stimulated in that classroom. And that was before I knew about Zaretta Hammond's work. That was many years before I knew about that. But to me, that was something that I greatly valued as an educator. And I thought it was important that all of my students receive the absolute best. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to one or two, one, one or the other of these two questions. So in what ways um, is your responsiveness actually helping, see, st helping students see themselves as learners? Or how might you build your students' competence to build their confidence? So that confidence piece is really important. I have, um, and go ahead and respond, and while you're responding, I'm, I'm just going to chat a little more. Um, uh, in, in my other world, I, I have had a, a tutoring business and um, oftentimes I'll survey parents just to, to find out how they have, um, how their students are doing and how they're responding to tutoring. Um, and one of the things that they often say to me is I notice that my child's confidence 
has improved greatly from working one on one with with the tutor. Um, and, and I think that that's really key because what they also see is that as their as the students confidence is their competence is building and their com confidence is also building but that translates to other subjects and it ends up creating a, a different scenario for for those students um, and it's really powerful quite honestly when we can do that um, let's see so in the chat um, the comment from parents is far too common, but it can be overcome. I'm presuming, Scott, you're talking about the comment that I received from the parent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, having taught in the self-contained class, held high expectations. That's the key, though. That is the key. Like, oftentimes you'll talk, um, you'll hear educators talk about their special education students, but you don't often hear special education and gifted at the same time um, and it's almost as though there's an expectation that if they're classified then they probably aren't gifted where I, I absolutely don't believe that at all I, you know that's just kind of an aside and just kind of throw that out there um, what else are we seeing in the in the chat if you're able to just kind of summarize some of the, the pieces um, responsive to our students um, so they're given dignity and power to learn because they feel valued and seen mm -hmm. um, multiple measures of um, showing students their abilities mm -hmm. um, I posted about using ex using students as their own experts like where they can build their own confidence for being an expert mm -hmm. um, working one-to-one -one, getting to know them praise them on what they're doing correct um, Sometimes kids have a hard time accepting that they could do more, so encouraging that they can do more, making it a safe environment for them. Yes. Um, making sure we're not responsive just to the scholars in the classroom, but responsive to the families and community. That's very important. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh-oh. Somebody's car alarm. <laughs> Sorry. <I've laughs> and my windows are open because it's so beautiful today, but uh, um, I guess that, you know, that could create other scenarios as well um, and here's some more this is actually from a, a different scholar who was a contributing author to the same book that um, Dr. Tyrone Howard um, that I referenced earlier um, this is um, uh, Tanika Orange who um, talks about culturally responsive teaching and what educators need to do and so you know these are actually some direct quotes from the book that I, I thought were really powerful um, where you know educators um, need to examine their cultural identities and know how those identities influence their ideals about teaching and learning I think that's really important because we all have a lens that we bring to education and that lens is really um, powerful and unless we uh, pay attention to our our own lens um, and how our lens informs what we do I, I, I received a a message earlier today about a, a presentation that was happening in a district and um, the uh, the person that was giving the presentation that per individual's lens was coming out in the presentation and it wasn't so much a presentation uh, like fully about equity but somewhat about equity but that lens was was um, uh, showed some implicit bias um, and so it's, it's important that we pay attention to our own identities and how that influences our teaching and learning. We acknowledge um, that we might have bias. Everybody has bias. Um, and we just, some, you know, some of our biases, we're very, we know what they are. They're very obvious to us. But the implicit bias, of course, are those biases that we have to uncover, that we're not even sure exists. Um, I often will share this example of an implicit bias that I uncovered about myself um, probably about a year or so ago um, and this is this isn't so much educational related but it really is is important that I re recognize that in myself I was calling um, the nail salon in my in my um, um, community and I caught myself while on the phone waiting for someone to answer, thinking, I, I hope that the white lady answers the phone. And some of you have heard me share this, um, but others may not. And, and as soon as that thought popped into my head, I was like, oh my God, I have a bias, and didn't even realize I had it. 
and because the the salon is owned by um, um, by Vietnamese uh, by Viet Vietnamese woman, and here I was, you know, thinking, well, you know, sometimes I struggle and I'm listening, and rather than having the patience to um, uh, to have a conversation, recognizing that there may be somewhat of a language barrier, but not really enough to not really enough to really be a barrier, quite honestly. But I recognized my own bias in that situation. And I was willing to confront my bias and address my bias and and keep it at the forefront of my thinking so that it doesn't inform how I conduct myself. And again, it's not a classroom scenario, but we have to be mindful of that, at, you know, in classrooms and in schools. Um, understanding that, you know, teaching isn't, again, this is emphasizing that colorblind piece, not neutral. It's not colorblind. Um, you know, understand that the intersectionality of race and ethnicity and socioeconomics, gender, religion, and so on will um, impact, you know, our thinking about teaching and the learner that's in the classroom. And again, just more emphasis on the, the colorblind piece that it disregards the importance of how these identities shape educational experiences of diverse students. So here's another question for you. How does your cultural identity influence what you believe about your learners? Or, because bias is not always explicit, how will you explore and confront your bias that might be implicit as well as explicit? I'm giving you a moment to respond. Now, Danielle, I'm looking at your response about your curriculum. It's good to know. It's, so here's the thing about, um, I'm just responding to um, Danielle's comment in the chat, you know, um, the challenge with um, looking at our own bias. It is challenging because we don't often want to accept that we have them. You know, it's hard for us to confront that. It's hard for us to be honest with ourselves about that bias or biases that we may have. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, Creating an environment that's safe, I think, is really important so that educators feel that they have a safe place to be able to address and talk through what their biases are and even understanding where they may come from, where those early messages come from. Uh, oftentimes our bias, and this isn't a session about bias, but oftentimes our bias um, is taught um, and may come from early messaging when we're very young as children and it informs our thinking and our actions as we um, grow into adulthood. And unless we are willing to confront them and be honest about them, because they can be unlearned just like they were learned, um, that process is not, you know, always an easy, it's an uncomfortable process. Um, Leslie, what are we seeing here? Uh, so I, I'm reading them, they're so good. So. Um, People saying that they have to check themselves constantly for internalized racism to make sure um, she has to check herself regularly that she doesn't, her desire to be one of the good white people. Mm. Um, usually someone will point out a bias and then that makes the, re the writer be thoughtful about that. Um, spending time prioritizing relationships so you can learn about the kids that you're working with so that you can pay attention to your own biases and your own baggage that you bring when you're working with kids. Mm -hmm. um, Another person says that their background makes them gravitate towards marginalized students because I see myself in them, mm -hmm. which also brings up other ideas. Uh, they, some people don't believe that they have biases, but they do, and they need to reflect on that. Yeah, um, that's a, a lot tough of self-reflection, a lot of self-reflection, a lot of, um, you know, people, uh, oh, here's a person whose th thoughts are that they don't have biases because they are black, a black woman, but they everybody does. There's a learning curve for everybody. Yeah. Um, considering how we were socialized early in life about race and racism, being aware of how we were so socialized. 
Yes. Yeah. And that's very true. And I've worked in urban and suburban districts and in urban districts, there's a, a, a higher um, percentage of teachers of color um, than there might be in suburban districts. And even, and I, I have seen the biases about students or the narratives um, about students of color being played out in both urban and in suburban settings. And so it's, it is really, um, these are some really good points that, that you brought out. Thank you so much. Um, here's some more, again, from that same um, scholar, Tanika. Um, you know, understand the ways of knowing are varied and they're defined through one's cultural context. You know, notions of participation, engagement, communication, patterns, respect, and use of language are oftentimes culturally based. We, we bring our culture to the context, um, knowing that culture adds strength and perspective to the learning um, community and exposing those divergent points of view that, that your students bring to the classroom um, or into your schools is really important. Um, and, you know, opening up various ways to see content and, and concepts strengthens students' ability to critique their own views and create new ways to see the world. Students are really dynamic in this um, and oftentimes ahead of the adults in being able to do that. It's they, but they often are asking for the adults to create the safe space for them to be able to critique their own views, to, um, to discuss the the world as they see it um, and share their you know divergent points of view but oftentimes it could be shushed because um, educators aren't prepared to have conversations that might um, make them uncomfortable um, but you know it's important that educators create culturally relevant authentic content and use teaching strategies that support the communication patterns language and learning styles of their diverse students couple more questions for you. How can you encourage your learners to share and respect one another's divergent views? And how does the content of your curriculum reflect your learner's culture? And how do you vary instruction to meet diverse learning styles? So you can respond to one or the other of these two questions. <clears throat> How do you do that? I often say that the low hanging fruit in a district that's looking to make changes that become more culturally um, responsive and culturally relevant is to look at the curriculum and look at the materials that you put in front of learners. That's kind of the sometimes the easiest um, work that you can do um, by uh, making sure that your, your curriculum is reflective of the culture um, and uh, race and ethnicity of the students that are in front of you. Um, there's a whole lot more work that has to be done, obviously, to create a culturally responsive classroom or school or district, but sometimes the, some of the easiest parts or the low-hanging fruit is that, um, that curriculum. So Ms. Taylor, I see your, your statement about um, the students and the conversation where, that your students will go um, in the classroom. And I think that it's important that educators um, give room for those uh, conversations um, at times um, because I think it's an opportunity to expand students' horizon and yet have a safe conversation that um, gives students an opportunity to critique the world around them to understand the world around them, to begin to learn more about um, divergent views. All of these, I think, are very um, important. Embedding a restorative mindset. Yes. And, and we're, we, that's, that's one really strong piece, Scott. Um, uh, that restorative mindset and even restorative practices, and we're not talking about that so much today, but 
that of course is another way of being culturally responsive um, to our students. Um, and yes, I agree with you, Lavelle, that our students need to see relevancy in their learning. Um, just looking at some of the other comments. Right, we do have to be a model for our students. Honoring them, really important. Yep. Great thoughts. Um, and I'm going to continue to just expand a, a little bit more on um, Tanika Orange's work. Um, you know, and she also talks about educators, you know, engaging students you know, in complex and controversial matters. It's kind of like what one of you said in the chat um, and helping them to analyze and crit critique their sociopolitical co context. I think we're living in a time right now where that is so important because we have, we're in a very polarized um, nation right now. And it's almost as though if you have a, a view that's different than the next person, we can't talk. Um, and there's no understanding that could come from the, the two polar opposite views. And yet I don't believe that. You know, I, I think it's really important that, um, you know, and there was a time, and we could probably go back in our, our history and our experiences, there was a time where people could come together and although they didn't always agree, they began to understand one another and develop relationships one another with one another. That's the kind of environment we we need to be thinking about when we're, um, when we have students in front of us, you know, how do we help them to really be able to analyze what's going on and to think through what's, you know, what is polarizing our country and how might they, because I feel like students oftentimes are the agents of change. Um, how might they be able to um, um, change the culture, if you will? Um, creating and building a school environment that practices culturally responsive care. So, you know, she distinguishes between, you know, just being culturally responsive and being, um, uh, having culturally responsive care, where, you know, caring conveys the feelings of concern for one state of being. You know, caring for um, is, caring about conveys that, but caring for is really about that active engagement and doing something to positively affect, affect it. And so I think that's a really important um, distinction um, to make. So let's, let's answer a couple of questions. Um, what policy and practice implications do you see for your district or your school or your classroom related to culturally responsive practices? And how are you actively showing care for students that they can acknowledge and appreciate um, coming from you? So meaning you're not just saying that you, you care for them, but they actually feel it. They are re responsive to the care that you show and demonstrate for them. And while you respond to that, I'll, um, Leslie, did you, did you see any themes coming out of some of the other comments that, that others made? Um, people were talking about social media, how it's overtaken a lot of our kids' um, social skills in terms of like, it's so easy to attack other people from behind the screen. Um, you know, it's something that we're lacking now because of social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Social media is very powerful. Um, and can be a tool that's used positively or can be used negatively. Uh, yeah, friends were once friends, now they're mm. enemies. That is, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking to see. Because it's like people aren't people anymore. It's like they are a viewpoint. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to, um, separate the two. And while you're, you're writing, I'm going to go on because I'm looking at the clock. Do we have five minutes? Is that what it is? Yes, you do have five minutes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, we're, we're nearing the you're end. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys are really, you're keeping the, the chat moving. So I appreciate that. Um, culturally responsive practice is not a program. 
It's not an initiative that can be adopted that you can pick up and put down. It's really a way of being. It is, um, it becomes the culture of your school, of your classroom. Um, it's a concept that teachers, um, you know, it's not a concept that where teachers need to know a whole lot about different cultures or ethnicities, as I was saying earlier. You know, it's really about knowing the students that are in front of you because there is no one culture at, and, and there's no monolith with cultures. And so it's really important that we get to know the students and what makes them different and unique, um, what stands out about them. That's what's important. Um, cult, uh, CRP is not strategies to motivate or engage certain groups of students. Well, let's help this group and let's be culturally responsive so that this group can be more motivated or more engaged. It really is not about that. It's really much bigger than that. All students need to be engaged. All students need their brains engaged. Um, and, you know, Zaretta Hammond talks about that and she talks about, um, you know, when students feel like they are liked, when they feel like they're respected or like they belong, they will engage, they will tune in. Um, think about you in, in, in certain environments. If you are in an environment where you don't feel you belong, you don't feel the people like you and you don't feel respected, you will disconnect from that environment, emotionally, sometimes physically. Um, same kind of things happen for students. I, I remember many years ago when I was a principal, I had a teacher who was very toxic and I inherited it, this teacher. Eventually we were able to move her out, but I inherited a teacher who was very toxic to students and was nowhere close to being culturally responsive and created a toxic environment in her classroom. And it unfortunately was a classroom with the, the, some of the youngest learners in the school. And you know, parents would come and complain that my child feels as though the teacher doesn't like them or that, that, you know, that they don't belong in the classroom. And it would seem absurd because it's like, well, how would anyone treat our youngest students that way? Um, but the students would slowly start to disconnect from that, that classroom, which is not what we want, you know. And so it was incumbent upon me as the school leader to address the issues that were at hand. Unfortunately, we were able to address them. But um, we can't have environments where students are not engaged um, uh, um, in the classroom. And it, it comes through the relationships that we build with our students. And I'm sure that's not a surprise to you. You see it over and over again in, in research um, and in the literature, you know, that how important the relationships are in, um, in the, with the students and, their, and the educators that they are in front of, that are in front of them. That's really key for so many reasons. Um, you know, and these are things that you've heard before, you know, getting to know your, your students, um, asking about and learning about their world. I remember when my son, second grader, he's an adult now, but when he was a second grader, he, um, he decided they were doing like a, the township was doing like a, like an American Idol kind of a thing. And my son um, decided he was going to um, audition and he performed in the, the community's you know, version of American Idol. And his second grade teacher came to the event. That meant the world to him. Um, and the fact that the teacher just cared, and I've seen that all the time. You know, I see that all the time with, with educators who really care and know what's going on with their students, finding out what they like, what they don't like, developing these relationships with their families that someone also referenced a little bit earlier and opening up, showing them who they are, um, authentically, meaning you share a part of your world with your students. Um, another um, scholar talks about becoming more culturally responsive by, you know, focusing on the deep cultural pieces, not just the surface thing. So it's real easy to be like, okay, we're going to have like, you know, culture day, bring in foods, let's play games and turn on music. That's low hanging fruit. You can absolutely do that. But it's another thing for you to learn about your students' communication styles and what their ideals are about friendship or, or what decision-making is like in their families and cultures or their ideas of fairness or their notions of time and all these pieces that are listed here. Those get you to a deeper knowledge of your students' culture and understanding who they are at a deeper level. So we've come to, I really hate this part because we've come to the, the you know, the end of a really fast um, hour, if you will. But I'd love to just hear if you have a takeaway from, from this afternoon session or 